Welcome. Thank you so much for being here this lovely, beautiful afternoon in San Francisco. And thank you to our sponsors, Alaska Airlines and Seth Banco, the Castro car guy of Ceremony Ford. And of course, thank you to, to Adam, our guest today. I don't think I'm as cool as like the Castro car guy. But <laughs> hopefully I'll get it together. <laughs> Well, welcome to the Michelle Miao Show. The Michelle Miao Show is your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. And uh, every now and then I get to do a program with my co-host John Zipper of the Commonwealth Club. Our special guest today, well, he bedazzled the entire world <laughs> at the uh, Winter Olympics a couple years ago. And not just the world, but he became the first out openly gay uh, uh, medalist at the Olympics and also dethroned Reese Witherspoon as America's sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the glamorous glamazon Adam Rippon. So Adam, thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to meet you in person and now I can verify. It is true. There is not a poor in sight. Yeah, I actually <laughs> donated them all to science. <laughs> I didn't need them. Leave. <laughs> but I mean, how could I turn down having a conversation with someone named Michelle Miao. So, <laughs> here I am. We'll tell that story a different day. If you all come back, you promise to come back to the program. <laughs> so Adam, it's tradition here on the show. I mean, okay. everyone from elected leaders to uh, uh, activists and celebrities such as yourselves have been asked here on the program to share a coming out story. I know yours is very special. And not only did you uh, come out to, to yourself, to your family, but also to the world professionally. So share with us. Okay, um, November 11th, 1989. Oh. Um, so I, I'm from like uh, a small town in Pennsylvania. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania. And, um, oh, Scranton. Yeah. <laughs> You've been. Um, <laughs> you're here now, so you obviously like it as much as I do. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, from Scranton, Pennsylvania, I um, always felt like a little different, but I didn't really understand why. Um, and then maybe when I was like in fifth grade, I remember having my first crush on a boy. Now looking back, when I, like, when I thought of it then, I was like, no, I just want to spend like all my time with him and, <laughs> you know, that's it. And um, I uh, remember just kind of thinking that like those feelings I would just keep to myself. And as I got a little bit older, um, I was like, you know what, this is just a secret that I'll have my entire life and I won't say anything to anybody. Um, meanwhile, I was like carrying a messenger bag everywhere. So it was like, maybe the secret was just, I thought I had it. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> it was like, no one will ever know. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I thought it was like the Meryl Streep of being in the closet. <laughs> um, but I think, y you know, I, I remember being, I remember the, f the first Queer Eye for the Straight Guy ever coming out. And I remember um, being in school and one of the girls in my class, we were just all hanging out in like a group. And one of the girls in, the, in my class was like, we're going to take my brother and we're gonna force him to watch Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, he hates gay people. And it's just gonna be so funny for him to like have to sit through this show. And um, I remember not really knowing why, but having that like pit in my stomach sort of feeling. And like, you know, when you're really young and, and somebody says that, and the first thing I say is, yeah, but you hold on to that for a really long time. Yeah. And I held on to that for a really long time. And then when I was in my early 20s, um, I uh, met a boy who also didn't come out until his early 20s. And then we started, he was kind of sharing his story a little bit. And then we started flirting. And then I was like, oh, whoa, this is gay. Um, <laughs> 
And then I was like, um, I guess I'm doing this. And we started talking. And then before like um, things escalated with this boy, I was like, I need to say something to my friends and to my family because I don't want them to not know what's going on in my life. But I kept holding on to this feeling that maybe my friends and family would think that I had been lying to them to the whole time. Um, and maybe I had been lying to myself the whole time. Um, you know, I had a few girlfriends like when I was in like a teenager. Um, and I was like, just like all humans are pretty. Like, um, <laughs> and they are though. They are. Um, <laughs> you just don't want to like, you know, sleep with all humans. Um, <laughs> Um, I thought I did, but I don't. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, that confused me a little bit because I was like, I don't think I was lying to them because I thought like, you know, I really did like them and I thought that I had feelings for them too. But like, this just felt so different that it was like, oh, this feels right. This feels like I'm not like hiding anything about myself. And so I told all my friends and my family and everybody's reaction was like, it, this doesn't, change anything. I remember I told my mom and my mom was like, you were inside me for nine months, I know. And I'm like, you really could have like cut a lot of shit out if you just told me. I, I actually really thought that you were going to share that you're, you told your mom or your mom knew and you came out at like 10 years old when she signed you up for figure I skating. I know. It, 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 you would get that impression from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you've been to Scranton, you would know that that would postpone this. Mm. Yeah. So um, uh, I think for a while I was lucky because my skating was just such a great distraction that I could just, you know, stay focused on that. Like no time for meeting anybody, no time for a relationship. So it was just like, I'm focused on what I'm doing, which I was. And um, but then, you know, life takes over. And you just, you meet people and like, you can't, you can't stop life. You can't stop growing up. But when I came out, I had this like overwhelming sense of just feeling so much better about myself. I felt so comfortable in my own skin. And a lot of the one thing that really helped me coming out was like, um, you know, this is almost 10 years ago is like on YouTube, people were putting their coming out stories and I would read different articles on different, um, you know, athletes or actors who were coming out. And reading their stories and seeing them still be successful, that gave me so much power. And um, it made me feel so good. And I was like, I want to be able to do the same thing. And so that's why a few years later, I decided to come out publicly. Um, I also decided to come out publicly because in 2014, the Olympics were in Russia. And um, I was hoping to like make the team. And then there was this huge cloud of uncertainty of what would happen if you were an out athlete and you went to Russia. And you, the US Olympic Committee couldn't tell us what would happen, they didn't know. Um, so we didn't know if like you'd be arrested upon arrival. You know, the, the law was like an anti-gay propaganda law, which I, what is yeah. that? These pants are gay propaganda. Yeah. So like, yeah. <laughs> so like, what does that mean? Um, and so, uh, you know, you can't be strolling down Moscow in a, in a blue and black, you know? Um, <laughs> you've tried it, I bet. <laughs> um, and so I... Uh, Never made the team, but I didn't. I never really said anything. I said that I didn't agree with the law, but I never said, you know, I'm I'm a gay athlete. Um, and I I thought about that, and then I was, so, you know, I didn't make the team, and it was the second time I had not made the Olympic team, and so I was sort of in this like almost rock bottom place of my career where I was like, I don't have anything to lose, so I started training like harder than I ever have because I was like, I'll just skate one more season. And then I started skating really well and I just was like, you know what, while I'm here and doing well, I want to be like a success story. And I want to be like, hey, you can be out and like be in the best shape and be your best self. Mm. Um, and I'm glad I did because, you know, when I didn't make the Olympic team, I was like, I don't want to be like not successful, a little bit fat and gay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
you know? That's not the representation I needed from Scranton. <laughs> Was there any blowback professionally from coming out? No, and, and I think, um, you know, so many things like in my career happened under the radar. Um, you know, a good friend of mine, Gus Kenworthy, he came out um, on ESPN magazine. And it was such a huge deal, especially like in the X Games world, for somebody like that to come out. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he was already an Olympic medalist. He was already such a successful athlete, and it was such a big deal for him to ex to like uh, share that part of himself. And I think that's why he's like a hero to so so many people. Um, but you know, when I came out, I was like I'd never been to the Olympics. Um, I was. Um, a, you know, an older figure skater who's like on the tail end of, of their career. Yeah. Um, you know, the chances of somebody going to the Olympics for the first time at 28 are really low. Um, and, and so I, I really came out under the, it wasn't like not on the cover of a magazine. It was like the way I came out was I did an article with one of my um, training mates, um, Ashley Wagner, and we were both training at the same time. And it was just an uh, article in the, you know, U.S. figure skating has a magazine that comes out like bi-monthly or every month. Um, one or the other. So it's like 12 times zero or six. So it's like <laughs> double what I said or like exactly what I thought. <laughs> um, so, and um, we did this interview and I said that I wanted to include, um, you know, my coming out in the interview because they were asking like, why are, you, why are you doing well? Why do you think you're successful? And I was like, I feel like that has a lot to do with it. Mm. And I want to share that. Um, but I don't want it to be like the focal point. Mm -hmm. Um, so we did the interview and it was with this lovely, um, reporter named Amy Rosewater and, um, she just lightly tucked it and folded it right into the article. And it was something that you would read and you just kind of breeze through. So I came out and that magazine had been out for like a month before it was like in like the ESPN to Twitter. So yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> Like that, nobody cared. It was it was not a, it was not a big deal. Nobody made a big deal of like me being an out athlete until I had made the Olympic team. Go Speaking ahead. of making the Olympic team, I mean the road to get there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it was know, the beaten path. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted you to share. Like it, it just sounded like you worked so hard to get there and share with us. You know the the challenges that you might have faced. I mean, I heard that you, you broke a foot and you still got up on that foot to, to make it to the Olympics. I yeah, how hard was it? Um, very. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, when I, but the first Olympic team I ever tried to qualify for um, and had a realistic shot was in 2010. And so, um, in... 2010, I knew that I was like an up-and-coming skater, and the only way that I was going to make the team was if somebody who, there were three favorites to make the team. If one of them had a mistake, my game plan had to be, I'm going to just be perfect, and I'll sneak right into that spot. I didn't sneak into that spot, but it wasn't devastated because I was 20. Um, but, you know, in the skating world, 24 is usually like the peak for a, a male athlete in single skating. That, um, you know, you're, you're at your best in your early 20s, 24 is like that golden age and then it starts to get like, mm -hmm. eh, yeah. <laughs> 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 and I was like, okay, you know, 24, this is gonna be right. This is gonna be the time, the timing's gonna be right. I, you know, I was an alternate 2010. It all seems, everything seems like I'm going in the direction of making the team in the next four years. Um, but then that's sort of like, you know, when life takes over again. Um, I think I felt that I put so much pressure on myself to, um, you know, those people who made the Olympic team, um, two of them had retired, and I was like, this is my time to kind of shine through. And um, in the very beginning, I did. And then I started to put all this pressure on myself of, I need to do this. I need to make it happen. It was like, it's going to happen now or it's never going to happen. And um, it just all kind of came to like a culmination in like the last event to qualify for the Olympics. So to qualify for the Olympics, it's based on like your track record for the past two seasons. And I had been okay, and there was a bunch of us that had been okay. 
And this one last competition would really push it over the edge or it would not. And um, I went in and I just felt like the weight of like my entire life's work on my shoulders and I did not skate well at all. And it felt like, what was the point of all of this? Like, was the point really for me to skate for all of these years and then to like embarrass myself? I didn't even skate badly and be like, no, nah, I gave it a good shot. I, I just was, it was like one of the worst performances I ever like competed and, and performed. And um, I just felt like, I felt like in such a weird place for the next few months and um, what finally really turned it around for me was, um, you know, I skated the next season because I was like, maybe I'll quit. And um, I skated the next season and I went to um, a Thanksgiving dinner with one of my really good friends. Um, and um, I've known her for like 10 years and I've known her mom just as long and they invited me over for Thanksgiving. So my family still lives in Pennsylvania. I live in California. And um, so I go over for Thanksgiving and... Um, her mom is like, so, you know, what do you, are you, like, how's, what, what do you want to do with skating? And I was like, well, you know, I'm just going to, like, you know, do my best and, like, <laughs> enjoy it. And she looked me, like, dead straight in the eyes and was like, you need to pull it together or this is going to be really sad. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, like, exactly what I was thinking but never said out loud. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I should really pull it together because this is getting sad. <laughs> and so we had our national championships and I had seven weeks before and I was like, you know what? It doesn't matter how I do in this event, but I'm going to like Julia, like Julian Michael, is that her name? Julia Michaels? Julie? Julian. Ju Ju Julian. Oh, don't tell her I like... <laughs> messed up her name she's she's listening i'm sure she is she, she's back there <laughs> yeah um so J jillian so i was like i'm gonna jillian michaels myself for the next seven weeks and i'm just i, I remember i never worked harder in in my life i would go there's like a track next to um my house so where i live in la and um i would go to the track and i would be there like at least four or five times a week for maybe two to three hours and then I'd also be at the rink and be skating for like four hours and um, I just killed myself for the next seven weeks and then um, I went to nationals and um, in the short program I skated one of the best programs I've like ever skated still and um, I got fifth and I was like <laughs> <laughs> I did all of that to like get fifth and I remember in one moment I was upset and the next moment I was like, who cares? I feel really good about what I did. Mm -hmm. And if I skate the free program tomorrow and I am still in fifth, I'm gonna be the best fifth place skater that ever has existed on the planet. I love that. I'm and gonna use that now. I'm gonna be the best fifth I'm place I'm gonna be the best fifth, because I was like, at this point there's nothing I can do. Like, it's in the judge's hands. It's not like I didn't, like, you know, we're not up against a stopwatch. We're not, you know, there's no score to keep, there is a score to keep track of. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, and I was like, there's nothing I can do. So like, I'm just gonna skate my best and um, that's gonna be that. So I go and I skate one of the another one of the best programs I've ever done and the score comes in and it's like a record and it's like the highest score that uh, at that time was ever at the U.S. championships and it, I have this moment of like oh my god I'm I'm gonna win <laughs> and um it was like up to the last skater and um he had been ahead of me in the short program and he skates really well not not perfect but skates really well and um the scores come up and he he's under me in the free skate but he wins overall and i have this moment of like oh come on like i just like did the best i could do and it like it's still i'm still second like and then i had this moment of like right after that this like flash between like before my eyes was like shut the like, you would have done anything to have been in this place last year, and it doesn't, it, winning doesn't even matter. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me to not win and to skate my best because 
also in that moment, I had seen um, the boy who won, was, his name is Jason Brown. And in that moment, I was like, Jason's been skating so well. Like, all, he deserves this. And I, I, ha I was happy for him. And I was so happy uh, for myself. And I was just excited that like, I, had, I had done it for myself. And I realized that that was really what it was all about. Um, and so I said, OK, you know what? I'll skate for one more year. And then right after I had um, gotten second at nationals, I came out publicly that, um, that summer. And um, I just felt like in this place that I had all this momentum around me that I was like, I really can win nationals. And I went, and I skated, and I just skated. I was just confident in myself, and I was really sure of like, who I was as an athlete. And more than that, like in a sport when you only have a few minutes to show everything you've got, I felt like I was able to do that, but also show who I was. Um, and I, I think that I also was like 26 at the time, and you know, a lot of my competitors are in their early 20s or in their late teens. And I started just to become really more sure of myself. Like, you know, it's very uncustomary. It's not customary, uncustomary. Um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> it's not customary to like ever communicate, like talk with the judges when you're at a competition. But when I was like 26, I'd like, you know, we'd be doing an official practice and we'd all get on the ice and you'd like focus and you're like doing all your <laughs> stuff and you're like, watch me. And I'm like skating really slow around the rink and I'd like wave to them. I'm like, hey guys, good morning. <laughs> and I was like, I'm such a because <laughs> nobody, nobody, nobody would do that, but it made me feel so in control of the situation. And it was like, I know somebody who's 18 would never even dare do that. I'm not 18. <laughs> We're going to get back to that uncensored, <laughs> uh, newfound attitude of yours. But John? So the Commonwealth Club, we've been around a long, long time. Some of you might remember Dan Quayle gave a speech once. Do you remember the Murphy Brown speech? That was at the Commonwealth Club. So we have history with vice presidents, so I wanted to ask you about a certain vice president. <laughs> that, was, that was an okay segue, right? Um, Mike Pence. What about her? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you told some of this on Friday for a radio interview, but if you could go into, again, how... Because I think there are a lot of folks who, who if they weren't skate following you from you know the skating history or from an LGBTQ point of view, they learned about you then, mm -hmm. and I think you became a whole hero to a whole other segment of the population. Um, was that also? I mean, your your willingness to just be direct about it was that also a, a, because you were more mature? Maybe you wouldn't have done that when you were eighteen or nineteen. No way. There's no way I would have done that. Um, but it was also sort of like, you know, to like continue is that like I, so then I, um, I'm totally gonna get to your question. It's okay. <laughs> We're all along for the ride. <laughs> so, you know, I won, I won nationals, then the next, the next year I'm skating really well. It's like two more years to the Olympics. I'm like, I can feel it, like I can do it. <laughs> um, I break my foot. Mm -hmm. And um, I break my foot with like, one year to go to the Olympics, and it's like, oh my God, I have all of this momentum. And in the moment I broke my foot, I was like, I can do this, I can still do this. And I'm sitting there, my foot is like the size of my thigh, which like doesn't fit in my pants right now. <laughs> but like, it's, it's enormous, and I know it's broken, and um, so I go and I moved out to Colorado Springs, the Olympic Training Center, and I rehab it for the next six months, and then I moved back to California to start training for the Olympics, and I was like, you know what? I have nothing to lose. If I don't make it, it's okay. But, like, I know that this is, like, a challenge for me, and I can take it, and I'm going to go as far as I can with it. Um, and I think that was the attitude that helped me qualify for the team. But I feel like all of these like, moments where I felt like I had nothing to lose was where I was my most powerful. And so going into the Olympics, having um, you know, the best experience I could have meant being honest in every interview, um, being candid, just having a normal conversation and not having like an interview that like if somebody came up to me and they said, 
you know, how are you feeling? I wasn't going to be like, never better. I'm going to just like <laughs> rock it. Thanks. Michelle. Um, I was going to be like, I'm really nervous and I think I'm going to have diarrhea for a week. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> or like, I hope the stress helps me lose weight. Like nobody, you know, nobody says anything like that, but it was like, that's how I would talk normally. So I was like, that's the kind of experience I would have. And one of the interviews I gave right before the Olympics was um, uh, with Christine Brennan with USA Today. Mm -hmm. And um, she asked me a question of what, what did I think of Mike Pence leading the US um, athletes delegation? And that meant I would have to answer that question honestly. I wasn't gonna say, oh, you know, you said, um, is that, and <laughs> what else? I'm so proud. Yeah. Not. Um, and I was, and I said, you know what? Um, I think it's a poor choice. I think it's a poor choice, like many poor choices that the Trump administration has put forward. Um, I don't think that he, re he doesn't represent me. He doesn't represent um, uh, I, a lot of people in this country. Um, you know, he's supported conversion therapy in the past. And I think somebody who thinks that I'm sick isn't a good representation of, who, of representing me. And that's all, that's all I said. Um, the next day, um, I was practicing and when my practice was over, I went to my phone and I look and I have like a million missed calls. Um, I have some from the U.S. Olympic Committee, I have some from my agent at the time, and I have some from U.S. figure skating. And I'm like, <gasps> okay, um, either <laughs> someone's like mad at me about talking about diarrhea. <laughs> Or I'm like, or so I did something bad and I'm in, a, in trouble. And um, I l listen to the voicemails and I call everybody back. And um, what they told me was that the office of the vice president ha had reached out to the U.S. Olympic Committee. So this was the next day the article came out. And, um, and, and that they wanted to set up a call with me to speak with the vice president. <laughs> Yeah, I know, my ex reaction exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think growing up, we're conditioned to be like, what an honor. Like, it's the vice president. And, um, and I'm thinking, maybe this is my time to, like, make a change. Maybe I can really make a difference. Um, maybe I, this is my chance to, like, for him to hear me out. And I think about it for a second, and I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> He didn't know who I was an hour before that article. He didn't know who I was until he read that article. And he's been, you know, really ruining people's lives for a really long time. And I doubt some loud, big-mouthed athlete who he's going to represent at the Olympics is the person that he's like, you know what? I'm going to level with you. Let's talk. <laughs> no, he's not going to want to do that. He's just going to tell me, you know, he's just going to correct me. I don't need to be corrected. I know what... I said, I know what his history is. And also that conversation isn't for me, it's for the people that he's really made life challenging for and hard for. Mm -hmm. That's not my conversation. I live in California and uh, he was never my, um, he never represented me. He never um, tried to um, pass legislation that would affect my life. And I'm very lucky for that. Um, you know, that conversation is for like the black trans woman who doesn't feel comfortable to walk outside and Mike Pence won't do anything to help um, protections for her mm. um, or for her not to be discriminated against. Um, that's who the conversation is for. It's for people like that, people who feel really, um, you know, not safe where they, where they live and it's from legislation that he's pushed. And I said, you know, I, I, don't, have, I don't think I have time for this. And so um, I spoke with um, the U.S. Figure Skating's um, media relations person. Her name is, is Barb, and she's a lesbian. Um, and I said, Barb, I've thought about what, I'm, what my decision is about, like, Mike Pence. And she goes, okay. And I was like, you can tell him to <laughs> himself. <laughs> And she was like, <laughs> I don't know if we'll use that wording exactly. <laughs> and I was like, I, I, I just, I don't have time for it. Like, I don't, I don't really need this. And um, that's, all, that's all that it was. And it was not supposed to be anything bigger than that. You know, 
and then you go to the Olympics and then all of these stories like come forward and then all of a sudden it got out that the president's office, the vice president's office reached out um, and that I declined a meeting and I declined a call and you know, they're asking me and I'm like, ask them, like, the, like ask, my, ask my team, they know the answer and my team is like, yeah, that, that's exactly what happened. Um, and I don't want to pull my teammates into this because um, they don't deserve that. That's like, that's not what we're here for. Um, and so uh, I, you know, then it turns into this huge thing because then the vice president, first of all, I'm not saying anything. The vice president's office is, that comes out, they're like, it never happened. Then they're like, it did happen. Um, and I'm like, oh my God, you guys are lying? <laughs> <laughs> so weird. You guys don't usually do that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you guys are really known for your honor and like truth. Um, and so I, I was like, whatever. And then all of a sudden, like the vice president is tweeting at me that he stands with me and he stands with all the athletes. And it's just such an insincere statement that like, you know, you, maybe you stand with me now because you have to, but when I go home, do you stand with me if I ever want to get married? Mm -hmm. Do you stand with me in like my community of people? Because like I come with all of these people too. You can't just stand with me. You have to stand with like all my LGBTQ plus family. And you don't. Mm -hmm. So he shut the <laughs> <up>. <laughs> I need to kidnap you, not really, security, <laughs> whoever's here, but like I could, you know, Adam could be my security in the world and be like, make me confident. Um, so leading to that, I mean, you came home from the Olympics and did you ever hear back from the vice president for another meeting to really work this out? No. And I know that there's some people um, who think that, you know, maybe I should have met with him, but I, I don't. I don't think that's not my, it wasn't my conversation to have. Um, I can't share my personal experiences of how like I, I've been affected by his leg legislation only from afar of how it would make me feel. Um, but you know, I, I, I've never heard back. I never expected to. And, um, that's that, that we, we don't want to hear, f well, you know, hopefully yeah. after 2020, we won't have to hear from Mike Pence. Anyway, John. It's, it's, well, it's possible Mike Pence wouldn't trust himself in a room with you without his wife there. <laughs> oh! Now that, that you was mean the mother? question. Mother, oh, yeah. yes. We wanted to ask, that was the question, if, if you get any Gator vibes about Mike Pence at all or what, what, what his deal is. I don't know, what I, is who his cares? Yeah, we don't true. want him. Okay. <laughs> 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 all right. That's, that's really true. Um, you know, going back to the, uh, the Olympics and you've shared with us, you know, just the, the personal journey, the challenges and all, every single time falling down, getting up, telling yourself you're going to do better, you're going to do great, putting the work in, you get to the Olympics, you do your thing and you win a bronze medal. Congratulations. Thank and, you. Yeah. How did you feel after that performance? I mean, was it everything that you had drummed up in your head and that, and going back to that conversation with your mom, like get your together, did you finally feel like? It was um, everything, it was more than I thought and less than I thought all at the same time. You know, going to the Olympics is an amazing experience, but it's so funny that you go there and you're like, this isn't for you to compete well. This is like a show for the world. Um, when we go um, to a competition, a normal, like a world championships or something, our event is like at, you know, 9 p.m., something you have a practice in the morning, you have, you know, five hours, and then you have the event at night. It's a, like, a, it's like a, a show at night. It's a, and, you, and you do that your whole life. You go to the Olympics, and they're like, your practice is at 4 a.m., and you're going to be competing at, you know, 10 a.m., not really. I think, <laughs> when was our practice? It was like six. It was set. That's one of my coaches. And, um, Hi, coach. <laughs> and um, so we had to practice at six and competed at, at like nine. And um, you're like, what? <laughs> but it's so that you can, so that we can um, be on primetime live television in the U.S., mm -hmm. So you're like, this isn't for the athletes to compete well. Like, you know, nobody's going to be like at their best at 6 a.m. And if you are, you're insane. <laughs> um, 
And, and so it was, you know, knowing that and then hearing from the other athletes of like, especially the, this, the uh, snow athletes who ski and everything, they said they, they never do all of those events all at once because it, it doesn't make for good conditions in the snow. And usually they need to be there for a while because there's so many days where it's like, you know, you can't compete, like the winds are too harsh or the snow isn't good enough. But at the Olympics, they're like, just go because the, everything has to <laughs> be done in a certain amount of time and they don't have a choice. So you're like, this really is just like this insane, crazy event that's just a, you know, it's like, you know, let's be gladiators to the death. And like, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think the people who do really well, I think that's why there's so many surprises at the Olympics. I feel like the people who do really well are the people who aren't expected to do well, who have no expectations or who are just so much better than everyone else that they're in this like euphoric state of like, I can't be beaten. It doesn't matter. And um, I think that's why people who like, there are expectations for them to do well, sometimes they falter because the s scenario that you're in is so crazy and un it's not like something that you can really wrap your head around. Um, but you know, it, it's sort of one of those things you've done a million times. The arena is the same. Um, half of it is completely empty because it's just filled with desks of media. Um, half of it is full. So it's like feels even less, it feels quieter. Um, but it's the first time where it's like, you know, what you do in that building just doesn't stay there or go to a few thousand fans. Um, it goes to the world. And you know, when I stepped onto the ice, I knew that I was, I knew the like world was watching at this point because of all of the media that was around me. And I knew that it was like, this moment is so much bigger than I am. Like, I have to do well or no one's going to take me seriously my entire life mm. um, because I've been having such a big freaking mouth the whole time. <laughs> and um, I, I'm like, this is really who, like what I show, like w when I can show my true colors. And, I, and, I, and I'm focused and I'm ready and I've never been more prepared and I can do this. And also if I don't do well, like Leslie Jones is definitely going to like post a video of me falling and her screaming. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's this sense of calm knowing that you're the most prepared. And then there's also this sense of fear of you're like, I know Reese Witherspoon and Britney Spears are watching. So like, <laughs> <laughs> and I also knew that a lot of the attention that I was getting was like people who just wanted to see me do badly. Um, and I knew it was people who had, who just wanted me to do well just because they, you know, hate Mike Pence. And so... Uh, I knew that that was also there with me. And, um, but you know, all of the things that I had been through had led me to like that moment for the level of preparedness I had felt because I was ready for anything. I was ready for anything to happen and I was still going to do well. I thought it was flawless by the way and the outfit, the sparkles, cold play, it was so <laughs> serene, it was beautiful. Um, so thank you for that. and. We, it's right around the time, by the way, that you had cards on your seat. So if you have a question for Adam, go ahead and fill them out. We have uh, Barbara who is walking around and collecting them and we'll ask Adam. And so one question before we get to the questions, you announced in late uh, 20 or recent rules. Well, yes, you, you announced it, that you were retiring, which mm -hmm. is kind of crazy as you don't look like you're going to retire from anything. <laughs> <laughs> But you it's retired. just good moisturizer. <laughs> I, I really am truly going to ask uh, about your skincare regimen later. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you announced your retirement from figure skating, and I know you're working on a couple of things, mm -hmm. um, such as a book that, or memoir, and I'm mm -hmm. sure you've covered a little bit of what's inside of the memoir here today mm -hmm. with us, which we're so lucky, and also some new projects in the media. I mean, you, you, you took the media by storm. I mean, you killed it. And now we just can't get enough of Adam Rippon. We want to see you. What's going on? What do you have coming up? Well, you know, I think the Olympics is that moment, an event that so many people are like, this is what I've waited my whole life for. And I remember, um, you know, also to go back, my, my, my Olympic medal, I couldn't have done without my teammates. And because they also stepped up to the plate when, when I needed them and I tried to be there for them. So to have that moment with them is just so incredible. Um, what was I talking about? We're, we're now talking about your retirement. Oh, right, right, right. right. 
<laughs> We're trying to sell a book later. Adam. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, I, to go to the, to, I, at 28, I was the f- oldest first time Olympian in figure skating since the 1920s. Wow. And my uh, teammates in the men's event were 17 and 18. Um, I sort of know that like I was in the best shape of my life at the right time at 28 and that um, it just felt like it was time to move on. It was time to be a cheerleader for them. I could be their teammate, but it was time to be like their cheerleader. Um, I still love to skate so much. Um, and I feel like very lucky because there's a lot of athletes that don't have the clarity that I really felt. Um, I skated three events at the Olympics and in the last event, um, my last jumping pass, I had done three clean programs and this last jumping pass would mean it would be like my third clean, perfect program. And I remember I landed the last jump and I was like, this is it. This is the last time, like, enjoy this moment. This is the last time you're ever going to be, like, an amateur in competition. And, you know, I'm still, like, skating my, like, program. But I'm like, this is, this is it. And I had two spins left. And I was like, I just, you know, better spin the out of these. Because <laughs> I'll watch this. I'll be like, this was it. And if I, like, did some lazy spins, I'll be like, oh, shoot. Um, and uh, I just, I... New. I, I just, I, I knew in my heart that it was like, this is how I want to leave it. I'm still going to skate because um, I don't want to get fat. <laughs> <laughs> so you still skate and, and you're writing and you're... Yeah. You oh, got, yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, so like yeah. people have the, that, mom, that moment. I know what I was <laughs> saying. <laughs> I for, <laughs> um, so when people have that moment of being on the podium and they're like, this is the moment I've waited for my whole life. When I was off the podium and doing all of this media and speaking to everybody and getting to make people laugh, I was like, oh shoot, this is the moment I've been waiting for my whole life. I've always, 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 you know, sometimes I've not always been the the best skater, but I was always the one who like could rally everyone together and basically sit in front of them and tell them any story and like make them laugh. And I was like, this is, you know, that's what I love to do. And then all of a sudden at the Olympics, I was able to do it in front of everybody. And I was like, oh my God, this is like, this is it. This is like what I love doing. This, and, and for so long, like skating was my outlet to be that performer. And um, when all of a sudden I was given the opportunity to like make people laugh and entertain them without my skates on, I was like, oh my God, this is more comfortable and I like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's what I wanted to say. So yeah. that's it. <laughs> so you just launched a YouTube channel. I did. Um, oh, and um, what I'm really excited about is that we filmed um, this uh, YouTube series called Break the Ice. And it's um, premiering this Wednesday. And it's basically a talk show on the ice. So I bring a guest on and we do an interview. But I'll stop the interview a few times to teach them a few skating elements. Um, and then at the end, I make them like do a performance for me, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. Oh my god! And we had so much fun. So I, yeah, you should definitely watch it. It's good. <laughs> and the memoir comes out in October the fall. October 15th. October yeah. 15th, and it is beautiful on the outside. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's go to questions from the audience. Sure. Someone asks, uh, do you think U.S. skating would support more skaters coming out, or is one of you en- enough as far as it's concerned? <laughs> I think one of me is enough. Um, but I think, you know, what, I, what I've seen is I think I've seen a lot of, like, younger skaters be out. I, don't, I think it's less of something that's taboo. Um, there was never any pressure to stay in the closet, Um, it's just, you know, you go out there and you're performing for like a million different people, but who you're really performing for is like seven people right in the front. And you're like, what are they going to think of me? It's not U.S. figure skating as a whole. They want you to do well. Do whatever it takes to do well. 
Um, and, and if you're a good role model, if you're a good athlete, if you work hard, we're going to support you. But at the end of the day, you know, what is the like 80 year old woman on the judging panel from the, you know, old Soviet bloc going to think of me skating to like gay club music? <laughs> <laughs> but what you don't give her credit for is that if the whole audience loves it, she's obligated to love it too. Mm. And you have to give those people credit, but we're so afraid of like what they might think or they might think that they might not like it. If they don't like it, they can just you know, say, you know, I, don't, I don't like this, I'm not gonna give it a good score. And I think that's sort of the hesitation a lot of athletes feel is that they'll be judged for who they are rather than what they do. And if it's not somebody's cup of tea, then you know, they won't drink it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think people are starting to see more and more that like, if you can represent yourself to your be the best of your ability and you're able to just enjoy what you're doing, that like we as humans love to watch that. Um, even if we don't necessarily, it's not something that we would normally watch or something that we love, but we love to watch people like living their truth. It's just that innate connection that we have between all of us. And um, I think that that's like the most liberating, that, that creates the most powerful athletes. So I hope more athletes are able to just, you know, experience that, like the, the whole point of what, you know, sport is all about. This almost takes off on that. It's, you are an inspiration to young people for so many reasons. What advice do you have for children who are still developing their authentic voices? Um, my advice is, um, as much as you think people are judging you, they think the same thing about everybody else. Um, we all think like, oh my God, what are people gonna think of us? What are people gonna think of me? Um, and that's a fear that everybody has, when in reality, sometimes people are so consumed of what they think people are gonna think of them that they're not even judging you. They haven't even gotten there. Um, and the one thing that I've learned is that we always have nothing to lose. When we feel like we have something to lose, that's when we hold back. That's when we don't um, give it our all because we feel like, oh, we might, we might lose something. But when you have this, I, I've got nothing, I've only, the only way is up, that's when you, you give it everything. And we, and we should always live in that. Those are the most powerful moments in my life and everything I get to do now, I go in with this, like I have nothing to lose. The only way is up mentality um, because in that way you never hold anything back and you should never hold it anything back so do that <laughs> <laughs> what types if any of dance training have you had to prepare for competitions um so when i was competing um when i was young i took one ballet class um a week i knew it <laughs> <laughs> but i st i hadn't taken a dance class um like a ba I, I stopped taking them when i was like 13 Mm -hmm. um, so they were like on Saturday mornings and it was just this one um, ballet Russian woman named Olga. And I remember she would come in and she'd have the highest wedges I've ever seen. And she'd be in like some sort of like sundress wrap and she had huge <laughs> <laughs> And she'd be like, she'd be like, no, 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 no. And I'd be like, this is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, oh, oh God, don't do that to me. <laughs> um, and so then, I, then actually when I got a little bit older, I would take a few dance classes. I lived like in, in New Jersey, in the poor man's New York. And so then <laughs> I would go into the city and I would take a few dance classes and, and that was it. But I've always loved music and I've always had a lot of friends in dance. Um, so it wasn't a lot of dance training. It was, I just have the rhythm myself. <laughs> Have you ever seen Yuri on Ice? Yes, I have. I love Yuri on Ice. For those of you who don't know, it's a, a Japanese anime that features actually a 28-year-old mm -hmm. uh, figure skater and his... There's a rumor that... Um, so you, if you like are a skating fan and a Yuri on Ice fan, there's, like, you can see similarities between a lot of current skaters and the characters. Um, and somebody said that they think that Christopher was based on me, which there are crazy similarities and I don't want to say that it's true, but it is. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, your bio that was sent to us, as well as what we named this program, uh, Adam Rapon, art athlete, artist, activist. Um, which of those are you most? Which are you at this time where you're, you've left behind Olympic skating? Do you see yourself becoming more of one of those than the others? Um, you know, I I do a lot of activism, and I think I fall into the activist category almost by accident. Um, I speak out on a lot of things that are important to me. And I think that I have a really unique opportunity and a unique platform where um, I can use my voice for a lot of people who feel like they aren't being heard. I'm the oldest of six kids in my family, so I've always sort of felt like a leader and a big brother. And I felt like a leader in my training group when I was training for the Olympics. And um, I like that role and I like that responsibility. So I don't really I, I do a lot of activism and I think that it just, I just do things that it feels, it feels right to me and that I feel like I have to do. And, and I enjoy doing that. I enjoy helping other people. It's nice. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> right. I, I've spoken here with a number of actually conservatives who have been very anti-Trump and the attacks that they get and their families get and the threats and the people coming up to them in grocery stores with guns and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And these are people who are pretty well known. It's like you, they're picking on people who are very prominent. Have you had, you must have, I mean, what, what's at, happened and, and how do you deal with that? Um, at, at the Olympics, of course, it was just like a multitude of, um, you know, if, if you, like, if you can't blah, 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 then get out. I'm like, I am already, I'm in Korea. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Sweetie, I can't let go any further. I'm like all the way on the other side. I never concerned you. You're, you don't, please. <sighs> but, you know, and, and um, I get some sort of like, well, if you didn't, if you, that's what you think, then blah, blah. I'm like, enough with you. <laughs> um, and most of it's been online. Mm -hmm. um, I've never really had anybody, I've been lucky that I haven't had anybody really come up to my face. I think the scariest situation that like I was ever in was um, one day I came home and um, uh, my uh, roommate's husband came up to me and he's like, I have to talk to you right now. I'm like, what the <laughs> did I do? <laughs> and he's like, um, the, the FBI was here earlier today. And I'm like, <laughs> again, what did I do? Um, <laughs> And um, this was when the, that crazy guy in Florida was sending bombs to people mm -hmm. um, addressed from Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And um, they, you know, found him and they took his, all of his information and he had a list of other people that he wanted to send things to. And I was on the list. Um, and so, you know, that's like a, a scary thing. Yeah. I don't even know Debbie Wasserman Schultz. <laughs> I don't need a bomb since my <laughs> Well, we're winding down on time and it's super sad. You've been like the light of my entire year so far. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> I want you to stay. I want you to be a part of my super big queer family and be an extended brother. I, I have to interrupt because we actually have someone who wrote in here saying that they, they want to be best friends with you <laughs> and Gus Kenworthy. So <laughs> Let's do it. Oh. I mean, the last question is, is a little serious. I mean, I have so much appreciation for you, and I think that uh, reading a lot of the comments when, you know, Adam Rippon took on Mike Pence and then won the bronze medal. And you don't only speak for our future and our youths who now, you know, can be themselves and be their authentic selves and know that it's okay as boys, they can like sequins and do twirls and jumps and stuff in the air and that's okay. But also you speak for our community as a whole and being, you know, a representation for even 
um, the range of, of sexuality, if you will, in our community. Not all the time is it super glamorous, super amazing when an effeminate gay man, you know, is himself. Sometimes it gets pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. So if you could leave us, you know, just the, uh, the last thoughts on being this bigger than yourself, um, activist, figure skater, uh, writer, et cetera, et cetera, this b bigger image for all of us for the future and now and beyond. I mean, how does it all make you feel? That's kind of big. I know. Um, I feel like one, I feel like a lot of the experiences that I've had, I'm incredibly lucky for the people who've come before me. Um, they walked so I could run. Um, you know, I, I think of people who I've spoken to, like Billie Jean King, who her experience of coming out is completely different of mine. It, it destroyed her career for a number of years. Um, and I, we've had the chance to talk and she's, t she's told me that like seeing somebody like me makes it feel like what she went through was worth it, which is incredibly humbling. Um, I also think that when we grow up, we sort of feel like we're only allowed to be a certain thing. I think sometimes when you're like an effeminate gay man, you feel like I'm, I'm allowed to be somebody's sidekick. I'm allowed to be somebody's gay best friend. And that's sort of it. Mm. I'm not allowed to like be the star. Um, and I never felt like that was right, you know? With a face like this. You're right. <laughs> what a waste, Michelle. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, uh, you know, I think also that, you know, there's so many, with being somebody like me, there's so many stero stere other stereotypes or things that we have in our head that, like, you, you know, I, you're the guy who you go into the men's locker room and they want to, you know, kick the out of you or they want to beat you up. And I was like, I don't, that doesn't feel like me. I feel like I have a power to walk into any room and... I can pick anybody out in the room and I can be like, I am going to be best friends with them by the time I leave. And I know that I can do that because I don't go in and I never go into a situation now. Um, I never go into a situation and, and try to explain who I am. I show you who I am and show you all the reasons why you should like me. And then if you don't, you have to be crazy. <laughs> But I think sometimes we all get so caught up in trying to explain of why, why we're worthy instead of just being worthy and showing that. And we all have that power. And, and, I, and I, I hope that I was able to kind of show that. But I think that that was, the, that was the biggest thing for me, that every situation I went into, whether it was like, you know, I, I remember even being at the Olympics and there was this one one athlete who I don't even remember. Um, but somebody was like, uh, I would just kind of like avoid him. I think he might be like, he's like, you know, religious and maybe like a little homophobic. And I was like, F that. And I was like, went over to him and I was like, why do you have such a weird haircut? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he looked at me and he was like, what? And I was like, you look a busted. <laughs> and, and just kind of like walked away. But then we started talking and we hit it off. And we were just having such a good time. And he, he like introduced me to his girlfriend who came over. And I was like, this is like, if you just go in and you, and you don't expect them to like hate on you, they won't. Um, and sometimes like our worst fears come true because we make them happen. Um, but my biggest piece of advice is that we all have that superpower to just be liked by everyone. And I think people are afraid and, and sometimes prejudiced of, of what they don't know. And when you're able to like break down that wall and just show, here I am and I'm, I'm like, I'm worthy of so much, people will believe that. Um, it's, so, it's like that fake it till you make it. And I'm still faking it. <laughs> <laughs>
Beautiful on the Outside comes out October 15th, so make sure you get your copy. I'm sure there's way more um, in the memoir. And also follow Adam's work. He's got his new YouTube channel, and I'm sure working on a ton of other things. I do want to make uh, one announcement, a great recognition. We have another Olympic medalist here with us today, and that's Brian Boitano. Brian, are you here? Brian here? Yay! <laughs> And and I know that Adam also can Brian's hit. like a hero, yeah. like a hero of mine. So that's yeah. it. Like have Brian here is so nice. So Brian, thank right. you so much. Yeah. Thanks for liking me. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, is, and and we know that Adam can hit the Tano Lutz, uh, right? That, 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 yeah, but now my shoulders are busted, so <laughs> they don't. I can't. Um, I want to thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon, the Commonwealth Club. It's the Michelle Miao Show, and thank you to our sponsors again, Alaska Airlines, Seth Banco, the Castro Car Guy from Ceremony Ford, and if, if <laughs> we have. <laughs> We have more exciting talks coming up if you head to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. There's more to come. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all that you do and all that you are. The amazing oh, Adam Ripon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.